Hey, this is Rob Connery from Switzerland. And if you are into martial arts or mixed martial arts, then you will know that this guy is a living legend. He's a three times King of Pancrase. He's a former UFC heavyweight champion. Um, he's one of, one of the very few members of the UFC Hall of Fame. He has shaped the early days of the sports like uh, no one else. Um, he finished his professional fighting career with a streak of 22 um, undefeated fights. He is now an actor, a TV host. Um, he is a really great guy, great personality. He's an entrepreneur with a lot of training products, um, a lot of uh, instructional videos, but also um, yeah, physical performance improvement products, which I'm sure we're going to talk about later on. Very interesting. And yeah, I'm really happy to have him today, Bas Rutten. Thank you for making the time. And thank you very much for that introduction. You know, if you go over the life really fast, you realize a lot of stuff. <laughs> yeah, I mean, how did you find the time to do all that? <laughs> yeah. What I find most, most amazing is you didn't, you didn't age one day in the past 25 years, it seems. I mean, if you watch all the... Well, you know, I, I do feel it though. I do. Everybody's <laughs> saying that, but it's, it's just about the lighting and keep it straight in your face once it comes from the, from the top. You oh, know, yeah. you go, <laughs> getting old. You know, so uh, all my buddies, they have the same, all my age. I look at them, I go, you, you're in pain when you wake up in the morning, right? And they go, oh yeah, I'm in pain. I say, and when you work out, the muscle aches, they stay? And they go, yeah, they stay. Okay, okay, good. That's not only me then, but apparently it's to everybody who, who gets up there in age, so. Oh, that's great. But, but did you feel as, as healthy and um, good as you did many years ago? You know, I actually feel really good. Yeah, I had a whole bunch of neck, neck work done, like neck surgeries, four neck surgeries. I oh, atrophied yeah. my arm, you know, all that stuff. But for the rest, I have to say, I, I, I feel good. You know, I'm still enjoying life. I wake up early in the morning. I'm having a, uh, just a great time. So, yeah, I'm not slowing down with that. It's just body uh, aches that, uh, you know, you have to just get up. You have to stretch. Every morning I stretch okay. for like 20 minutes, you know. So I'm very limber. I can still fall and split so they can go over. But, you know, it really helps with my knees. I have really bad knees. Well, not really bad knees. I have no cartilage on my kneecaps, which I thought oh, was which a really is bad. solution. But it's the worst, the worst problem you can have in a knee because it's the only thing they cannot change. All the other cartilage they can replace, the wow. kneecap they Here's the thing for right now, but uh, a buddy of mine did it, and I'm I'm gonna wait a year till he has it. <laughs> okay, <I see. laughs> and if he feels good after a year, I might do it as well. Okay, that's great. That's great. Um, yeah. So um, maybe for the people who are not into MMA and martial arts, can you explain a bit so what it is that uh, you made in your active career, and what mixed martial arts are, and what they can uh, imagine this. I guess most people nowadays they will know it, but uh, ten years ago, most people you know, it was new. Um, very few people knew about it. I, mean, I know when I started watching the first videos, like back in uh, 2000, well, in the early 2000s, I guess. Yeah. Like, what, what, what the hell are you looking at? This is, this is crazy. So, so um, you know, it's uh, th when it started, they called it free fighting, where I came yeah. from, from Holland. I'm from Holland, yeah. originally from the Netherlands. Uh, well, it's a mixture. And I like to always say to people who don't know what it is, I'll do it very, and, and big John McCarthy is a famous referee. He, he actually was the first guy who said that it's a mixture of four Olympic sports. You take the punches from boxing, you take the kicks from taekwondo, you take the wrestling from wrestling, and then you take the submission game from judo. Yep. They put all those Olympic sports together and boom, there you have mixed martial arts. It's all pretty much with the same rules. There's a lot you cannot do. A lot of people think, for, oh my God, it's in a cage. You can do everything. Of course, that, that, you know, you put, prisoners in a cage or you put animals in a cage so you know we had to get rid of that stigma in the beginning it was looked upon very heavy but i have to say early on uh, like the ultimate fighting championships it was there were no rules they literally say and the rules are there are no rules yeah. <laughs> i think there was no no eye gouging and there were two, two things no eye gouging and something else in the beginning probably biting or uh, yeah oh, biting, yeah biting yeah i think those two things exactly yes really, i've seen somebody get hit in, in the pills like 26 <laughs> times in a row like i mean that was legal yeah. uh, i remember all the way back that they asked me they said would you want to do that i said there's no referee because the first two you've seen the referee the first two you've seen the referee was not um, allowed to, to step in to stop the fight. It could only happen by the guy either tapping or verbally quitting, and otherwise it was um, the corner throwing a towel. But then yeah. they realized that one guy got beat up really, really bad, and the corner didn't throw a towel, and the referee looked at the corner, and they turned away his back to the referee, and he goes, what's going on? Later on, you asked him, and they said, yeah, if he, if he would have thrown the towel, the fighter would have beat us up. That's what he said. <laughs> <laughs> 
So yeah, it was hard to get rid of the stigma in the beginning, but unfortunately for us, there came rules and everything started, and uh, and it became a mainstream sport now. Right now, I mean, the UFC sold for four point two billion dollars. That's that's more than any soccer club out there. It's huge. It's huge now. Yeah, yeah. So, w would you rather be yourself now um, or yourself like from twenty five years ago in today's times? You know, no, no. You know, I'm. Uh, We're here for a reason. God put us here for, for a reason. I did my path. And the, and the cool thing about me is you already touched on it in the opening. I'm in the, the UFC Hall of Fame in the pioneer section. Mm -hmm. So that means the guys who started it. And that section will only go grow as much, you know, because there's like maybe 100 people who started this thing or less. So all the other ones, a thousand years from now, yeah, you became UFC champion, you come in the Hall of Fame. But we were the guys who started it. And I'm very proud of that. So, uh, yeah, no, I'm, I'm completely happy with my life. Don't need to be young again. Would, would be great, but then I want my whole family to be young again as well. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, I was surprised to hear about your story because you didn't have um, kind of an introduction to sports as you would expect. You were not uh, kind of always that sporty and aggressive guy who were getting, getting into fights. You have quite a different story how, you got, um, how the whole thing got started for you. Yeah, you, you mean my diseases that I had as Correct. a kid? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I was just born as a very sick kid, you know. I, I, I was completely covered in eczema when I popped out. Uh, that went away after four months. And then at four years old, I got a, a contracted rheumatic fever, spent in the like three, four months in the hospital for that. At six years old, we moved from the big city to a village uh, to live closer to my dad's job. And as soon as we arrived in the, the village, I started getting asthma and, and bad asthma. Mm -hmm. Every day I would have asthma, but at six Every six weeks or so, I would have an asthma attack, which would be a week or eight days in bed, not able to do anything, not even eat because I couldn't breathe. Uh, not only that, on top of it, I got this really bad skin disease, uh, eczema, and it was uh, very bad on my hands, on my arms, in my neck, you know, behind my knees, and I had spots on my body, but my hands and arms, they were really bad. It was literally when I would make a fist, it, it would sometimes burst and like gross stuff would come out. So it was... Uh, It was really disgusting and needless to say, you know, when you're a kid, other kids, they don't understand that. You call you a leper, you're, you're, you know, they think it's contagious. And you can't blame kids because that's kids. But, you know, when you're the other kid, <laughs> it's, it's not a fun thing. You know, so I was always a loner. I played a lot by myself. Um, Spider-Man, Wolverine, I was reading a lot of comics at the time. And I was, I was really good in avoiding the bullies. By go I, I went literally from treetop to treetop. We had a big forest at the back of our home. And I found out that I could climb in a tree and I could start swinging the tree to the next tree. And there were only like four spots in the entire forest where I had to literally go down because that would be, the gap would be too, too big. But that was my, I, that's the only thing I did every single day. I climbed all the highest buildings in my, in my uh, town because I always was this, I was always attracted, still am a little bit to, to heights. Somehow I'm afraid of it, but because I'm that, I want to go up there, you know? So uh, churches, everything. You know, I had to go to the top. I always wanted to climb the top. And, you know, like I said, with bullies, if they came after me, which happened a lot, you know, and uh, I would simply climb a tree. And I would wait till they started climbing a tree and almost were there. And I would start swinging, go to the next tree. Mm -hmm. And they, of course, didn't want to do it. There was one bully who did it one time and the tree broke oh, and he okay. fell. Yeah, he almost died. I mean, his head was this far away from this big rock. And everybody heard about the story. So from that moment on, I was safe in the trees. <laughs> so <laughs> that was a good thing. But, you know, needless to say, from all the bullying, you know, you start, uh, eventually you get fed up with it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I saw a Bruce Lee movie in 1976, I believe it was. Um, I was 12 years old, together with my brother. Um, we, we watched the Bruce Lee. We, we sneaked into a, in a movie theater. It was in France. We were on a holiday there on a vacation. And... Uh, It was 17 years and older. We sneaked in. We saw the movie, and I realized if I become like Bruce Lee, then the bullying would be would stop. So um, I asked my parents. Took two years of begging and uh, asking because they thought it was martial arts. You know, they thought it was violence. They're very conservative, my parents. Uh, but after two years, they finally allowed me. And then it went. Everything went really fast. I had this guy, this cool guy. My neighbor girl was a very pretty girl, and she had the coolest guy in town, Xavier. Xavier, you would call him here, but uh, X started. But it all just Xavier. And um, he took me under the swing, and I was uh, training at the adult classes with uh, the adults Taekwondo. And from that moment, it just went really fast. Like in, in months, I was beating the adults. 
and wow. people started talking about me in the dressing room. I overheard them talk, speaking of me. Like, man, this kid is good. Then he just dropped Jack again. Oh, people are laughing. And he's, he's a really, he, he can really fight. And once you hear it as a kid, you know, you get confirmation. And then I got in a, in a, in a street fight with the biggest bully in the school. Shucky was his name. Yeah. <laughs> you still remember his name? I still remember his name. Yeah, Shucky Van Eric was his name. Uh, yeah, not, not the really great. His family, his brother was in jail for something, for robbery or something. It was a, but it, but he was always going after the kids. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was riding my bicycle on the street. And um, he came with a group, like six guys, on his bicycle as well. Uh, they started shouting words, hey, leper, watch out, your ears don't fall off. Something like that. It was always something along those lines. And this time I shouted something back. And I heard them laugh and I looked back and I see them turning. They started to chase me. So I, I told myself, there's no need for a chase now. So I put my bike on the stand. And I was just waiting for them. Uh, they surrounded me. And I always talk about this. It's so funny because when you have a badass movie, you know, at the middle of the night, you have a fight scene that goes to the death. You have cars around these guys. And the headlights of the cars are the lighting for the fight. <laughs> and they fight to the death. And people are betting like these rich people. It yeah. wasn't like that. Only this was during the day. And it was with bicycles. You know? so, <laughs> <laughs> but if you think back, anyway, he came to me and he started pushing my chest. And... Uh, challenging me and if I wanted to hit him, come on, Ruta, hit me if you want. Come on, leper. So I did. <laughs> and uh, and, and it, that was it. it. It was one punch. I, I was amazed. I knocked him out, out cold. His nose was flat on his face. He broke that nose. That was not so good later on. His friends didn't do anything. So I realized immediately those were not his real friends. You know, if you can beat him, join them. I think they were just afraid of him as well. And uh, But because of the nose... He had to go to the hospital. He had to set it. And because of that, the police was, of course, okay. cool. And now the police showed up at my mom and dad's doorstep. And I have to say, my, my mom and dad, I never told them that I uh, had so much trouble in school. You know, my mom had a lot of work with me. Like every night, we, she would mummify me. Like the whole family would send in old bed sheets, which they would rip up in bandages. And I had to put all the cortisone creams on. She yeah. woke me, picked me up. And then at night, I would scratch it off because of her. And she had to do it again. So... I was a lot of, you know, I was a lot at home, a lot sick. My mom had to help me a lot. So I never told them about the bullying because I didn't want them to worry anymore. So they took me off. They took me off Taekwondo. But then when I was 20, I started uh, immediately again back to Taekwondo and karate. I started doing everything at the same time when I left the house, my mom and dad's house. Uh, I started Thai boxing a year later right away because I wanted to, to fight full contact. I started competing in Thai boxing all six weeks later after I signed up. And then I started just knocking a lot of people out. They went really good. Um, it was very hard to get opponents. I stopped. I became a bouncer. Mm -hmm. Not a smart idea. Had a few more fights. Lost a fight, which really made me decide never to fight in Holland again. Because by then I had a really great record. I, had all, I won everything by knockout and I lost a fight. Mm -hmm. um, and suddenly I was the worst Thai boxer in Holland. So. I didn't want to do anything for them anymore. I started doing martial arts shows. Like yeah. on music, we used to do these martial arts shows, these choreographed fights and break tests and flying kicks and all that crazy stuff. We come up with backflips and somersaults. And, and on one of those shows, there was a guy, Chris Dolman. And Chris Dolman was a guy who was fighting, competing in Japan, but he had his students. He was an older guy, but he was still competing. But he had his students fighting in Japan as well. And he stopped me and he said, Dude, I, I remember you from Thai boxing. You were such a great Thai boxer. Now I see you doing all these backflips and somersaults and, and the athletic abilities. Did you ever think about free fighting? And that was pretty much it. You know, I went to a class one time, got completely destroyed by everybody. Was very uh, good for my humility. I mean, trust me, because I thought I was a bad badass but I, apparently I wasn't on the ground I was I got choked armbar I mean they destroyed me um, I came home my wife laughing I had to drink liquid food for three days because my throat was so messed up from all the chokes that I got and I thought I could hold them but anyway you know um, I, I had injuries I didn't go a lot suddenly there's a phone call and that started it all and it was him and he said boss you have to come to Amsterdam right now jump in your car Mm -hmm. there's this new organization called Pancras and they're looking for fighters we got two scouts here and they're looking for fighters come over there so I, I went over there I got into a brawl with one of his fighters because he was fighting in Japan as well for a different organization and he wanted to show off I guess so he started to go really hard against me because they were filming and I told him I said no we don't have to do that you know they're looking at technique they're not looking to knock each other out so let's tone it down and I think he thought that I was afraid so he turned it up 
So I stopped him again and I said, it's okay if I buy me, but it's not going to be one-way traffic. You understand that, right? I'm going to do it back. And now, of course, it was on. But for a very short amount of time because it knocked him out right away with a high kick. And it looked really cool because it was on his eye, so he needed a whole bunch of stitches. Oh, great. To the hospital. Great to government. What more can you expect? The, the, the scouts, I saw them point at me, you know? <laughs> and, uh, we want him. <laughs> so it got me in Japan two and a half months later, September 21st, 1993. Mm-hmm. It was crazy. Such a long time, 25 years ago now, my very first fight in Japan. And, you know, I know it's a long story, but that's everything, how it worked. And whoop, and that's where I started fighting. Um, well, okay. That's very impressive. Very interesting. And then those, those times are really different. I mean, the, the, uh, the audience was different than today's audience, less educated, I guess. Um, no, not in Japan. In, in, that was the greatest thing in Japan. In Japan, they, in Japan, the audience understands that you're the professional. Mm. So they don't shout at you what you should do. You know, okay. It's like Tiger Woods when he's uh, playing golf. I'm going, to go, use a nine iron! Use the nine iron! <laughs> I would never do that, you see what I mean? Because I understand that he's much better than me. Well, I actually really suck, but he's, he's really good at that. Here in America or the rest of the world, except Japan, Everybody likes to tell you what you should do. Yet 90% of those guys don't fight even themselves or don't even train. So it's very funny how that works. But in Japan, it's complete silence. Mm-hmm. Now, that helped me a lot because in Thai boxing, I was super aggressive. Mm-hmm. I was literally, I came out very technical. I would get hit and then I would just knock them out. I, would, I could not stand it. Somebody get me hit, that they would hit me. When I went to Japan, the first day, I didn't know the rules yet. I knew what we could do, submissions, but there were some different rules set there. I didn't know how many rounds. I, d- I thought there were weight classes. So I found out there was no weigh-in. And normally the weigh-in happens the day before the fight. I figured, ah, you know, this, this, they're known for being honest, these Japanese people. So I guess it's on the day of the fight. I'll make sure that I'm, a, don't, I'm not more than 205 pounds because I thought that was my weight class. Didn't even know. Didn't even think about it. So the next day I see my opponent. He's like 6'4", the nope. tallest Japanese guy I've ever seen. And I'm looking at him and I go, how, how, what is his weight? They said, 245. What are you? I said, 203. I get, but is that not too heavy? He says, no, 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 boss, there's no weight classes. We just fight everybody fights everybody. I go, oh, really? I go, yeah. <laughs> yes, awesome. I love but of course I was bluffing because inside I'm thinking, now I'm fighting a guy 30, 42 pounds heavier. And then before he went, looked, uh, walked away, I asked him how many minutes were the rounds? How many rounds and how many minutes? He said, oh, it's just one round. And I was all happy again. And then he said, 30 minutes, like in half an hour. Right. That was the fight. No break. And you trained for how many, hour, uh, how many minutes? I trained for five rounds and three minutes, full, but full power, you know? So now I had to adjust my whole schedule because if I would unload in the opening of the fight, and the Japanese are known for being very tough. You just gas out. Out. Yeah, and I got 28 more minutes to go. That's not a good thing to do. So when I came up, everything was calm. I mean, you can literally put somebody in the 30th row Mm -hmm. and he can speak like I'm talking to you right now and I can exactly what he says in the middle of the ring. It's complete silence. When I knock somebody down, he goes, whoa, everybody gets up. And then 10 seconds later, it's complete stillness again. And I think that changed me as a fighter. I became this really calculated fighter it was amazing like now for, for my tie boxing every picture that i you would have of me hitting somebody my face would go ah! you know it was like i wanted to kill the guy but in pancreas it was just you know there was no facial expressions anymore everything became relaxed the blocking whatever they hit me there was no no more flinching no more nothing i was completely in the zone and i i truly believe that's because of the audience it was so quiet so relaxed and they were actually rooting for you like when i knocked him out my first opponent uh because it was a palm strike to the head since he was taller so i could palm strike him under the jaw mm-hmm. and then later i kicked him and need him in the head there's a long story but anyway <laughs> they started uh, cheering for me it was the most amazing thing i mean if you do that in any other, other country you know just people might start booing right you just Knock somebody out from their country, but they people were freaked out. I mean, they put a baby in my hand. I remember standing with the baby. I felt like the president. You know, like hey, when he takes this. it was so surreal. And the wow. next day, people bowing to me on the street. Like one every out of eight people would bow to me. Wow. Okay. So then I saw the newspaper, and it was a big picture of me hanging in the air because I. Apparently, I jumped in the splits to every corner because I was so happy. It was 43 seconds. Uh, 
it was something fun. Split. Yeah, and it became my trademark later on. I had to do it after every fight that I won. But that picture was in the air on the, in a newspaper, and my opponent was laying but not below me on ground, knocked out, and the people recognized me from that picture. But uh, it was crazy. It's an, uh, if you if you never been to a different country like that far, never be on an airplane, and then you go from Holland for a thirteen hour plane trip all the way to Japan, it's a complete different world, you know, and then have that experience. Yeah, that was uh, really cool. You never forget those things. That was something. Bro. Oh, yeah. But your, your first few fights, you were not as successful as late in your career, right? You need to learn a lot of things. Yeah. So I knocked the first guy out, second guy I knocked out, and then they knew, okay, we're not going to stand with this guy. Now, my groundwork was not good at the time. I trained once a week, if that, in, in, in Amsterdam. Uh, And that was just a two hour drive from where I used to live. And, you know, and sometimes didn't, guys didn't show up. So it was hard for me to find training partners. So my third one, I lost, it was a toehold. Now don't let the word toehold, uh, make it think that I saw somebody break a shin bone with a toehold. So it's a very powerful lock that they put on the ankle and it's either your ankle is going to give your knee or if the shin bone is weaker, it's a twisting motion then the shin bone might break. And that's what happened with that person. My, my ankle just blew up. I didn't know what it was. I knew it hurt a lot <laughs> because I tapped on it. And then my fourth fight, I believe I won again and I won another fight and boom, again, by submission, I would lose, hmm. you know, and that went on and suddenly I lost the third time by submission. Hmm. Um, and that got me very angry because I'm one of these guys who never wants to go to a third mistake. Yeah. Two is okay. Third, that's unacceptable. Uh, I became very vocal. I started asking everybody, every gym where I went, is there somebody who wants to train with me? And I found this one guy, Leon Van Dyke is his name. And he, he started to train with me. He was a young guy, very good Thai boxer, athlete, super strong. And we just started watching videotapes and fights and would break down everything. And then I got obsessed with ground fighting. I would literally two, three times a day, we did only ground fighting. F striking, yeah. sparring, we didn't even do anymore. We just did the tie pads, like when you hit like focus mitts by, for kicking. That was for stamina. We did that four times a week for stamina and the rest only submissions. And I never lost a fight again. I won my next eight fights by submission. So yeah. I always tell people, ah, I'm not good there. I don't want to learn. I said, dude, if I can do it, you can do it. I'm nobody special, you know? Yeah, I learn fast, but guess what? The, people, the guys who have to work, work harder for it, they're going to be harder to beat. Because they had to work harder for it, so they don't want to give it away. You see what I mean? There's always a plus and a minus. So, uh, but it helps, you know. Like I said, never lost the fight in again uh, anymore. Just putting in the work. That's it. Yeah. And what I liked about you, um, you've always been a very technical fighter. So you you always had a good understanding for what's behind the actual movement. So a lot of guys probably are just you no. Know, They're, they're practicing a movement, but without understanding it. And you always seem to understand exactly what's going on and how to, uh, how to use gaps in their knowledge against them uh, and what they were doing. You know, I've been messing with people my entire life. You know, when I was a kid, I was the class clown. You know, I couldn't get attention uh, positive. I'm going to get a negative, you know. Well, negative, it was positive for me, but for the poor teachers. I mean, I, I, I was kicked off every school almost, you know. My poor mother... But I was always messing with people. And I thought, you know, because if you mess with, if you disturb their equilibrium, if you, if you start talking and you cause a little bit of stir up in the brain, that can really affect their fighting. And I would do that right away from the beginning. You know, I would think about what I was doing. I would say certain, I would speak English to my Dutch corner. Mm -hmm. They never got it. All the fighters, they go like, why, why do you think I would speak English? Because I want you to understand what I'm saying. You know, if I look at my corner and I'm going to talk about where are we going to party tonight? You know, last time we went to the Motown place. I didn't really like it, right? Did you like it? No. No, let's go to gas penning tonight, okay? Okay, one second. I, I, I'm busy here. And then I would continue to fight again. And these guys, I know they're thinking like, what, what, what is this guy doing? Is he busy with going out? Or does he want to fight? But you see, I start making them think. I start getting inside their heads. And that's what I did with the stand-up game as well. You know, I do a certain thing. I realize... Um, I always say it like this to my students, students, I give you a pattern. Mm -hmm. And once you get my pattern, then I break the pattern. Yeah. So I give you, I, I move down. Every time when I point you to the stomach, let's say with a straight to the, with the left straight to the body, I can do it just like this, but that doesn't have the desired effect. If I would every time lower myself and mm -hmm. I do this over a course of like five minutes, every time when I point to the body, I completely do this. Soon enough, I don't even have to punch anymore. I only do this and he's already thinking it's a body shot. 
Yeah. You see, I painted that picture in his head like this is a body shot. And if you do it a few times, suddenly you just dip and then you come suddenly with the right on top. You see, and I started really enjoying those kind of things, tricking your opponent out. And thankfully, the place in Japan was the best place to do it because everybody was perfectly quiet. Okay, okay, interesting. Um, for someone who's never been in a in a ring or in a cage, um, what's that feeling like to enter a ring and knowing now now it's gonna get uh, shit's gonna hit the fan? <laughs> yeah. Exactly. You know, this is my first fight. I remember, I don't remember a thing for my first fight. I, I know that I, I lost uh, or won, but I don't, I don't know. I, I was a back kick, but I always told the people, if they would have blindfolded me and they would have called in three other tie boxers and they put them all next to each other, I couldn't have said I was fighting him. Oh, it's really? like you don't fight a person, you fight an identity, a silhouette. It's really weird. There's chaos in your head because okay. you never controlled it. My buddy Amir said it the best. Um, he said, imagine you have a plank and the plank is one foot wide. It's like two inches thick and it's six feet, uh, 20 feet tall, right? Long. Mm -hmm. And you put it here on the grass and you have to walk over it. That's a very simple thing, right? Everybody can do that. You put the same plank in between two buildings, 10 stories up. Now do it again. Nah. That is fighting. Because fighting is in the training, you make a mistake. Well, you, you will feel it, but you're probably not going to get knocked out. If fighting, you make a mistake, you're going to get knocked out. There's no room for mistakes. Or if you leave an arm out, you get arm barred. You, if you let go, you get choked. You get a leg, leg lock. You know, I mean, there's so many ways to win and so many ways to lose in mixed martial arts. So you have to control everything. And once you can control it, then you fight at the best. There's a lot of guys who are really good in the, in the dojo, in training, yeah. but they can never perform it under pressure. There's guys out there who are in the gym who will beat the world champions in training, will completely destroy them. And then you think, oh my God, we have another world champion coming. And somehow they cannot, yeah, yeah. they cannot overcome the fear and they lock up. They don't want to throw anything. They start overthinking things. If After I do this, I'm open here. Maybe he's going to kick me here. You see, you start, once you start doing the what ifs, oh, you're going down. <laughs> you should never think, what if this happens? Yeah. And, and that's it, you know? So, and I, I believe it's in every other sport. You know, if you look at uh, basketball, you know, the last one, if you, dunk, if you win this one, the whole team wins. If, if you sink this shot. But if you don't, you're going to lose. That's a lot of pressure on that person for the last possible moment. I figured he's going to the same thing as the fighters go to. But you did it so many times, you know, if you're unfazed, you'll still land that shot. And, and that's with fighting. As long as you can control it, you're going to be fine. But did you ever feel fear of an opponent or did you ever feel fear of a, of a fight or is it fear of getting hurt, fear of um, whatever? The, yeah, the, fir the first fights, you, you're, you know, there's these moments that you think, what am I doing here? What, why, why did I sign up for this? Especially when they told me 30 minute fights and with a 43 pound heavier guy, you know, I was like, yay, you know, acting, but inside I go, dude, what am I doing here? This is the craziest thing. But, um, I don't know. It's, it's like I said with the heights in the beginning, remember I said, I'm kind of afraid of heights, but that's why I want to conquer it. Maybe that's it. You know, if I'm afraid of something, I'm doing it immediately. Okay. Because I cannot stand it to be afraid of something. So then I try to overcome it by simply doing it. And, you know, once you do it, it's like the first time you get into a car. I thought, and especially in Europe, you have to drive with a stick shift, right? Yeah. Here you can get your test done with an automatic. Or with a stick shift in the beginning, you're like, oh my God, what's going on? You have no clue what you're doing. And look at us now. I mean, people eat their breakfast, they stir their coffee. Yeah, yeah. It's it's not cigarettes and not and yeah. You do everything. It becomes normal. And see that as fighting as well. You know, it becomes normal. Once it becomes normal, yeah. Sometimes you might still think, oh, little nervous or you got a strong opponent. But I was always really good in, in talking to myself. Mm -hmm. It's very simple. If you talk to yourself and you really go over the dangers that are there in fighting, mm -hmm. there are no dangers. If I get knocked out, there's a referee who's going to pull them off. If I get in an arm bar, for instance, yeah, I can let him snap my arm or I can be smart. I tap. And I can fight the next month or two months later again. If I get, you know, knocked out at days and the fight stops the fight, okay. Is that really so bad? No, it is not that bad. But what is bad is that the, the backlash of negative negativity that from people comes. Mm -hmm. I always tell my students and every fighter, I say, I fight for me. I don't fight for my family. I don't fight for anybody else but me. And it sounds very egomaniac. And, 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 and it has to be as well. 
because I realized that if I put the pressure on myself to fight for, for my family and we need the money and we need this, there's more pressure on your shoulders, you fight the worst. If I don't care about anything, I just fight for me, then I fight the best. I, my, my students, if they're nervous, I say, imagine this, imagine your opponent, like tomorrow is the fight. And uh, I said, imagine your opponent walks into the gym right now. We put you guys both in that room. We lock the door. There's no windows in the room. Mm-hmm. You guys fight. Winning or losing, you're not allowed to say who won and who lost. You open the door. Do you care if you would have lost that fight? And they all say, no, I wouldn't care. I say, see, because you're fighting for yourself. But why do you care is because your friends and family members are there and you don't want to lose in front of them. And mm-hmm. if, you can, if you can put that to the side... Oh man, it frees up everything in your head. You know, there's a referee. My opponent's going to be right in front of me. As long as I don't do this, there's nothing he can do. And I, I will never do this. As long as I keep it right in front of me, I train for this two times a day. You know, surprises, yeah, it might happen. But I mean, it's got to be very hard to surprise. It's very hard to surprise any fighter because that's what we do all day long. Uh, so it's, it's not that dangerous, but they make it dangerous in their head. That's what I think. I see. I see. Um, you mentioned that your parents were uh, very against you starting your fighting career. Did they? Did they live to see your uh, see you at your peak? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. They're still alive, and um, and they're very proud. Right now, they're very proud. In the beginning, you know, listen. If you go into a cage in the UFC, <laughs> they were actually in America watching my first UFC fight and uh, in my apartment uh-huh. uh, with a whole bunch of group of uh, people from my gym. While I was, fight, I believe it was in New Orleans that I had my first fight there. So they came, they, they came to support it uh, eventually. But my mother, you know, when I started Thai boxing, uh, I would call her after the fight and I would say, yeah, I knocked him out again. And she would always, how is he? Is he okay? And I say, mom, I just want, can you can't say uh, congratulations and then, then ask that question. You know, she was always worried about the other people. But, uh, you know, once she realized and, 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 Uh, reporters came and they started filming and a documentary came out and then they started filming uh, what you have to do for it. You can't eat this, you can't go out, you can't drink, you you know, all these things. And it's a sport. And once they saw that, like, whoa, wait a minute. They didn't expect that. I I think for the outside world, it's like uh, two animals in a cage. They just drink beer, they do whatever they want and they just fight, you know. People don't realize that you train a lot, two times a day, everything needs to be in order in order to fight good, to fight well. So once they realized that, they were good. Here comes the sunshine and burns away clouds like they never were.